Tonight, I want to thank the uh, Congress of Civil War Roundtables for the opportunity to speak about the Lincoln Funeral Train. This is one of my favorite topics. I used to live, in fact, near the railroad tracks in northeastern Ohio uh, for 23 or so years. Uh, that, and these are the very same right away that the Lincoln Funeral Train traveled back in April of 1865. Uh, during the trip uh, back to Springfield, Illinois. So tonight I want to go take us back to that, that train ride. What was going on in 1865 with the President of the United States body? As we all know, Lincoln was shot at the play um, and our American cousin, John Wilkes Booth, as shown in this picture here, uh, snuck into the presidential box, shot the president. He expired the next morning on April 15th at the Peterson House in Washington, DC. Now, all of this was sudden, unexpected, of course, and left the government scrambling to figure out uh, multiple things. One, you got to move Mrs. Lincoln eventually out of the executive mansion. Uh, you've got a plan on what to do with Lincoln's body. How are you going to, are you going to bury it? Where are you going to actually put the body? Um, Mrs. Lincoln is so distraught by the whole affair that Robert Todd Lincoln uh, needs to take a leading role in uh, helping her determine what are we going to do with the body of the late president of the United States. So the nation's plunge into mourning, uh, but while that's going on, the government officials are working feverishly, not only to identify who Lincoln's killers were, uh, with a number of uh, broadsides and uh, flyers that are put up throughout the region offering rewards for the alleged uh, accomplices of John Wilkes Booth. Uh, but while this is going on, again, the plans have to be laid for what are we going to do with the dead president? We've got Andrew Johnson uh, now coming into office. We've got to get uh, Lincoln's body taken care of. Now, back in the spring of 1861, Abraham Lincoln had taken a train ride from Springfield, Illinois to uh, Washington for his inauguration. Mrs. Lincoln and Robert Todd Lincoln decided that this is the best thing. They want to take Lincoln's body back to Springfield, Illinois. Uh, Mary Todd Lincoln and Abraham Lincoln still considered Springfield to be their home. Uh, they had rented out their house uh, and they'd always planned on moving back at some point in the future. Well, now Abraham is going to go back. Uh, Mrs. Lincoln wants the body of William Wallace Lincoln to accompany his father. So they're going to disinter that body uh, in embalmment move, put it into a separate coffin, and they're going to transport it back to Springfield with his father. So that much they kind of got settled. Then they start working on the route. Now, the route's a little different. Uh, often in books you'll read that the Lincoln uh, funeral train replicated and reversed the route of the inaugural train back in 1861. Well, that's not really true. Parts of it are the same, but there are certainly discrepancies. Uh, back in 1861, the Lincoln Funeral Train went through Cincinnati and Pittsburgh, did not stop in Chicago. Uh, on the ride home uh, for Lincoln, uh, now as a dead man, but they're going to skip uh, Pittsburgh, skip Cincinnati, and they add Chicago to the schedule. So much of the trip is similar, but you've got that very important loop in the Midwest that is quite different. You've got to have cars for Lincoln's family and friends. So you've got one car, of course, that they're going to need to transport the two coffins. You need a second car for the family and friends. Uh, the government appoints a 29-man honor guard, uh, mostly veterans from the Veteran Reserve Corps, uh, typically invalids or convalescing soldiers. Uh, you're going to need to put on senior military officials. In fact, two uh, commanders from the Battle of Gettysburg uh, are going to be on board, John Gibbon uh, and uh, John Caldwell, each of whom commanded a division at the Battle of Gettysburg, they're going to be on board. There are various other generals. They're going to be admirals on board as well. Uh, and as, of course, Congress wants to get in the act, so there'll be at least one congressman from every northern state uh, that will be on board as well. The mayor of Chicago, all of uh, Chicago City Council, Mayor of Springfield, many of Lincoln's law partners and friends, uh, and politicians from the Springfield area are going to be on board as well. Uh, now, this is one of the very first times that a president is going to be transported so far for burial, uh, and the first time by rail uh, to this kind of distance. So they're also going to have the embalmer and the undertaker on board the train as well. And finally, the government decides to allow seven reporters to ride on the train as well. Two from the Associated Press and the other reporters were from Philadelphia, New York, and Chicago. 
Uh, so this all told, you're talking about roughly, let's say 150 people that are gonna be on board the train. Uh, so we're talking about the funeral car, a car for the family and friends, a baggage car, and six passenger cars that are gonna be required pretty much at all times to transport this very large delegation. Now also keep in mind that this is going to be run over independent railroads. Uh, they are interconnected. Luckily, they're all the same gauge. So the funeral uh, car itself in the uh, baggage car in the president's family car, those three cars are always going to be together. Uh, each of the other railroads that are involved in this uh, endeavor are going to have to provide their own locomotives, tenders, and their own uh, pa six passenger cars. And so they're going to pull the three if you will, government issued cars all the way. So this is going to be a major undertaking, uh, sending Lincoln's body back. But from April 15th through April 18th or so, they've made all the plans. It only takes about two or three days to put all these plans in place. Uh, it's a pretty monumental undertaking, again, because you're going to contact every single railroad. You've got to arrange to, for them to agree to have that locomotive ready to go. You've got to work on a timetable, work on schedules. A number of, of cities want to have Lincoln's body lying in state, uh, particularly state capitals. So you've got to plan that, organize that as well. Uh, get all the arrangements made on where are we going to take the body off of the train? Where are we going to put it back on the train? Uh, how is that all going to work? So logistically, there's a ton of work to go on over a three-day period. There are certainly a lot of cities that are disappointed. They're not gonna be selected to be uh, cities where Lincoln will lie in state. Uh, a lot of people clamor for this uh, privilege and certainly only a handful will get that privilege. Now, first things first, the government's also gotta figure out we need a coffin. Uh, so they're going to arrange for a coffin for Abraham Lincoln, it costs $1,500. Uh, it's a little longer than he is, but not by much. Uh, it's six foot six inches long. Some accounts suggest it's walnut, other accounts suggest it's mahogany. Uh, but either way, it's fairly sturdy and very expensive. Um, you can see on the picture here, uh, thousands of silver tacks are hammered into the wood coffin to give it an ornate pattern on the side. And so that's what Lincoln's going to right in, of course, throughout the rest of the journey uh, to Springfield. Now, the car shown on the bottom right of this photograph is the Lincoln funeral car. Uh, today's world, we have Air Force One, we have the helicopter Marine One, whenever the president's on board. Back then, I guess you could have called this Railroad One, although that designation did not exist. Uh, but the government had never had an actual uh, rail car or any other formal transportation designated solely for the use of the President of the United States. Uh, over the winter of 1864-65, they built this car in Alexandria, Virginia, at the shops of the United States Military Railroad. Uh, now, Lincoln was scheduled to try it out uh, on April 21st or so of 1865. He's dead, he's obviously not gonna do that. But again, work crews are now scrambling in Alexandria to convert this car from a lush passenger car into again, a, a three compartment car that will have one compartment for Lincoln's body, uh, a separate stateroom, and then a, a smaller room for uh, William Wallace Lincoln's body. So they're gonna remove the green curtains. They're gonna uh, strip down a lot of the furniture, take it out, put in black heavy cloth uh, draperies, things like that, and prepare, build a catafalque for each of the two uh, coffins uh, for storage, uh, bolt those catafalques down to the ground and uh, have mechanisms to put the coffins in place to secure them with straps uh, as the train jostles through the countryside. Uh, as mentioned, every railroad is now prepared to uh, put their trains on the tracks. The government's got a few other plans as they're making uh, for the funeral train, but in the middle of that, you've got to display Lincoln's body to the public. So on the 18th, uh, even as plans are still being finalized for some of the details on the funeral train, Lincoln is now lying in state in the East uh, Room of the Executive Mansion. Uh, on the 19th, of course, is Easter Sunday, so Lincoln's body is not on public display that day. Uh, memorial services all across the North and in some parts of the South 
uh, will memorialize the dead president, uh, offer eulogies for him, uh, prayers of hope and promise for the country, prayers for the new president of the United States, Andrew Johnson. On the 20th, the formal uh, procession will begin taking Lincoln's body uh, from the executive mansion to the Capitol building where he will lay in state at the rotunda. This, by the way, will be on the same catafalque that John F. Kennedy uh, will use. And also, as I understand it, uh, Kennedy's body will be on the same limber or caisson uh, that Lincoln's body has, has taken uh, in this photograph back uh, on April 20th of 1865. So Lincoln's body is on display again, the 18th and the, and the 20th. Uh, by that point in time, they've got everything worked out uh, pretty much for the ride north. So on April 21st, uh, exactly one week after Lincoln was shot at Ford Theater, uh, his train will leave Washington, D.C. Now, the government had decided that there, uh, on a couple things. Number one, uh, every single leg of the journey to Springfield a pilot train. Uh, each railroad not only provide a, a Lincoln, uh, an engine to pull the Lincoln train, they're also going to provide a pilot train. Pilot train typically consisted of a locomotive tender and one passenger car. Uh, that train would leave 10 minutes in advance of the funeral train. Uh, it served two purposes. One, it was to alert the small towns along the way, and there were more than 400 towns that the funeral train would go through. It would alert them that the funeral train is 10 minutes behind us. So if you wanted to ring your bells, for example, uh, toll the bells, or if you had minute guns firing, uh, firing blanks from small cannons, uh, or if you had choirs that wanted to sing along the tracks, you had 10 minutes warning that the train was on its way. The second reason for the pilot train is certainly a little more subtle, but every bit, in fact, perhaps even more important. You got Lincoln's body on board this train. You got at least 20 members of the United States Congress. You've got senior military officials. You've got uh, just a lot of people on board. And there are a lot of bridges. Uh, and these are bridges that the Confederates had burned down uh, back in 1861 uh, and throughout the war. In fact, they'd also attacked some of these bridges again. So there's a concern that uh, perhaps there would be sabotage. Now, keep in mind, we're, less, we're only a week away from the assassination. So nobody still has caught John Wilkes Booth. Nobody really truly knows how deep and how wide this conspiracy goes. And could there be a gang somewhere or another, nefarious group of individuals, or maybe even just one individual that would sabotage a bridge uh, and perhaps drop the Lincoln Funeral Train into a creek somewhere? And so the thought was, well, we could lose the pilot train if we have to. Uh, so if the bridge has been compromised in any form or not, uh, the pilot train would certainly uh, bear the brunt of that damage. So the first train uh, out of the, I think, 17 or so different railroads are going to be involved in moving Lincoln's body is the Baltimore and Ohio. Uh, so from the Capitol Rotunda, Lincoln's body is again uh, transported with the honor guard to a train station, in this case, uh, to the Baltimore and Ohio station. This is uh, the station, as you see in the picture, is long gone. There's now a park there along uh, New Jersey Avenue where the B&O station was. Uh, but this uh, depiction of drawing shows what the train station would have looked like roughly during the Civil War period. Uh, the body is loaded into uh, the train car with uh, William Wallace Lincoln. Everybody files on board and they uh, pull out uh, for the uh, two hour trip to Baltimore. Uh, going to leave roughly at eight o'clock in the morning uh, from Washington, D.C. Now, this view from Frank Leslie's Illustrated, somewhat fanciful, of course, shows the inside of the Lincoln funeral train, uh, the funeral car itself. Uh, you'll see senior military officers that they'll sit or stand guard uh, in and around the, the coffin, flag drape coffin in this case. You see these heavy black draperies. Uh, all the furniture has been removed other than the chairs. And you see this, you know, catafalque, I think it was built of pine or so that the uh, coffin is now laying on. Train's going to arrive on time in Baltimore at Camden Yards, uh, Camden Station. Uh, this train station is still there, of course, next to the baseball stadium in Baltimore. Uh, so this is one of the few surviving train stations 
from the Lincoln Funeral Train that you can go visit and still see. Uh, so the train's going to arrive, Lincoln's body's going to be taken off the train, run through the inner harbor of Baltimore uh, to the Merchant Exchange. Uh, more than 10,000 people show up in a light rain to view the body of Abraham Lincoln lying in state. While that's going on, the three train cars that are going to go on to Pennsylvania, again, the funeral car, the baggage car, and the Lincoln family car, are going to head to uh, Calvert's, uh, actually first to Bolton Station, and then on to Calvert Station, where they will be hooked into a, a waiting Northern Central Railway train. So again, we go from the Baltimore and Ohio, the second railroad that's gonna pick up the body is the Northern Central Railway. Uh, now, one other uh, thing the government has asked is that in every key city, uh, the first major city or the state line, that the governor of the receiving state will uh, enter the train and take ceremonial charge of the Lincoln funeral train as the delegation will pass through his state. Uh, governor Augustus Bradford will be the first of these governors to step on board in downtown Baltimore. He's a war Democrat. He had supported Lincoln's policy uh, he had worked very closely with Governor Curtin of Pennsylvania, worked very closely with members of the Republican Congress during the Monocacy campaign and the uh, Jubal Orley's assault on Fort Stevens uh, back in July of 1864. Um, and Bradford had, had, had proven to be somewhat of a favorite of Lincoln. They got along pretty well, and Lincoln thought fairly highly of Governor Bradford. So he has the honor of being the first governor on board uh, to any, he boards on Baltimore with his delegation. Most of the railroads along the pathway will issue formal uh, schedules. This happens to be the Northern Central schedule. I, I won't obviously reproduce all of the schedules from each of the uh, various railroads involved in this, but this is typical, just showing what the ads that'll appear in newspapers or the broadsides that go up alongside the tracks, warning people of the times at which the Lincoln Funeral Train will pass through their towns. So for example, here, leave Baltimore at 3 p.m., arrive here where I live in York, Pennsylvania, uh, for a mandatory water and uh, fuel break, 10-minute uh, break there, uh, so the train could steam on to uh, Harrisburg, where it was scheduled to arrive uh, at 8, 10 p.m. So five hours and 10 minutes, including two brief stops, one at uh, uh, right at the Pennsylvania border and the second break uh, scheduled for fuel and water. Um, and this is typical, uh, very typical. Now, but again, the government's going to decree that in towns, uh, the funeral train is capped at 10 miles an hour. Uh, if it's out in the open countryside, they're gonna cap it at 20 miles an hour. Again, they want people who are lining the tracks to get a, as long a view of the train as they can. And again, the relatively slow speed gives the engineer time to look for anything untoward that might be happening on the tracks in front of him. Also, that's, of course, going to be the exact same speed that the Lincoln Funeral Train's pilot train is going to run 10 minutes in advance of the schedule. Uh, there are tokens and artifacts left in the Lincoln Funeral Train. Uh, on the left, you'll see the actual badge worn by uh, William Henry Harrison Gold. He was a resident of Baltimore, Maryland. He worked as the conductor for the Northern Central on the train that ran from Baltimore to Harrisburg. On the left, you'll see his mourning badge that he wore on the train, the, uh, the actual trip. Uh, that is in the possession of the Dauphin County Historical Society in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, where I took this picture. But it gives you an idea, again, uh, there's not a lot left in some places, but this at least gives you a view of what some of the mourning badges in this case would have looked like uh, as a Northern Central Conductor would have worn this. Now, the first stop the train's going to make after steaming through Baltimore County in front of very large crowds, uh, places like Parkton and Moncton, uh, Freeland, as it arrives in Pennsylvania, it arrives at Summit Number One, uh, a little village now known as New Freedom, Pennsylvania. There, Andrew Curtin, a Republican governor of Pennsylvania, will take over the train. Now, again, as I mentioned, he and Bradford had worked very closely together the previous year during the Monocacy campaign. And Governor Curtin takes the unusual step of inviting a Democrat, a war Democrat, but still a Democrat. Uh, so the Republican uh, governor of Pennsylvania 
invites the Democrat governor of Maryland, uh, don't leave the train, ride with me to Harrisburg. And the two of them will have a hearty conversation to which one of the reporters on board would actually comment about how uh, well uh, these two men got along and how relationships between Maryland and Pennsylvania had never been so strong as they were at this period of time. Uh, the Lincoln Funeral Train, uh, by the way, Curtin's train had been there for almost an hour waiting for the Lincoln Funeral Train to arrive. It sits on the siding there on the left. And then of course, when the funeral train arrives, Bradford uh, greets Curtin, gets on board with his entourage and off to Harrisburg they go. At 6 p.m., they're gonna roll through Hanover Junction. Now this is Lincoln's second visit to Hanover Junction. His first visit, his train would have taken the tracks on the left, which went to Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. That visit was on November 18th, 1863, as Abraham Lincoln is rolling through Hanover Junction on his way to Gettysburg to deliver the Gettysburg Address. Obviously, he's not going to Gettysburg now, he's dead. Uh, and so his funeral train will roll through again at 10 miles an hour, taking the tra train tracks on the right, which lead to the largest city then and now between uh, Harrisburg and Baltimore, the town of York, Pennsylvania. But first, they got to go through the Howard Tunnel. This is the, I think, the second or third oldest operating railroad tunnel still left in the United States. It dates back to the 1840s. Uh, the Howard Tunnel is, again, a place of concern. Uh, they're going to make sure now, back during the Gettysburg campaign, Elijah White's Confederate Cavalry from the 35th, 35th Battalion Virginia Cavalry had tried to uh, bring this structure down, uh, but they were chased off by Pennsylvania State militiamen. So again, there's concern about this tunnel. Uh, there are Union Guards stationed here. Uh, there are a number of people in and around to make sure no mischief is going to happen and none indeed occurs. At 6.40 p.m., the funeral train arrives here in York, Pennsylvania, where the Democrat anti-war, Democrat, uh, very anti-Lincoln uh, editor of the largest newspaper between Harrisburg and Baltimore, a Democratic paper called the York Gazette, uh, he has arrangements for this 10-minute water stop. While in York, six uh, women uh, will bring a, a very nice uh, bouquet of white roses uh, and camellias. Uh, York, Pennsylvania is the white rose city of Pennsylvania. York, England, of course, is the white rose city of England. Uh, Lancaster, Pennsylvania being the red rose city. Lancaster uh, in England being the red rose city there. So symbolic of the town of York, it's white roses. Uh, with camellias uh, and violets that are also put on this bouquet. Uh, these six women will come on board as well as a black man, uh, Aquila Howard. Uh, and the women will hand the bouquet, uh, sick in this uh, very large three foot wreath. And uh, this black man, free black man, Pennsylvania uh, citizen, will put uh, reverently the flower arrangement on Lincoln's coffin. Uh, he and the six women will then leave uh, train's been refilled and it'll head north to Harrisburg. Now it took a little bit of maneuvering to get the long Lincoln funeral train uh, with its nine cars uh, into downtown Harrisburg. There was not a Y or any kind of uh, ability to easily turn a train around to put it on the uh, Cumberland Valley Railroad's bridge. Uh, but they, again, the next railroad involved, Cumberland Valley will not use any of its locomotives, but they use their track and their bridge uh, to reach Harrisburg. Uh, and so there's a little delay. It's probably closer to 8.20, 8.30 by the time the train actually arrives in downtown Harrisburg. More ominously are the clouds. Uh, there's been a drizzle all day. And now just as they start unloading Lincoln's body at the train station, putting it in the hearse to take it to the state capitol where he's going to lie in state that night, a massive thunderstorm hits in downtown Harrisburg. Uh, 40 to 60 mile an hour wind gusts, massive amounts of water standing in the streets. The sewer systems in Harrisburg back up, uh, making this a stinky, smelly, soggy, miry mess throughout the streets. And they hot rush as quick as they can to get the funeral entourage into the state capitol. Uh, obviously there are no photographs known of the hearse uh, bearing Lincoln's body in uh, Harrisburg because you're not going to take a picture there 
we'll see plenty of pictures later. Uh, but in Harrisburg, as the thunderstorm continues to rage, uh, selected uh, government officials and uh, important Republicans, important people of the town uh, are allowed to see the body on display uh, that evening. Uh, they're going to dust off the body at the end of the day. They're going to make some repairs to Lincoln, make him look better. They're gonna apply chalk to his face to make it, it was starting to darken a little bit. So they want to lighten it back up. And then uh, at seven o'clock on the morning of uh, Saturday, April 20, or, uh, April 22nd, 1865, they're going to allow uh, the public to come in, long lines. There are 10,000 people in line. Obviously, most of them will never see Lincoln's body. They're trying to get them through as much as they can. The mayor of Harrisburg, Augustus Rumford, a French uh, immigrant, uh, has charge, of course, of the ceremonies uh, in Pennsylvania, uh, at least here at the state capitol building in conjunction with Governor Curtin. Uh, and uh, this uh, photograph on the right shows the Lincoln catafalque. Uh, the body's gone by the time this photograph's been taken, uh, but at least gives you an idea of what the interior would have looked like. Uh, after this two hour session, uh, the doors are closed to the public, leaving a lot of soggy people outside. Uh, it's kind of dried off by now, but many of these people have been in line all night long, standing in that thunderstorm uh, for one hour. Again, they're gonna allow dignitaries uh, members of Pennsylvania's uh, con uh, congressional delegation, uh, Pennsylvania State Legislature, Pennsylvania State Supreme Court, uh, Harrisburg officials, et cetera, are going to be allowed to view the body. At 10 o'clock, the coffin is closed. Uh, there's a faceplate that's closed uh, that uh, will hide Lincoln's uh, 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 face from viewing. Uh, they're going to now take Lincoln's body back to the train station where the third railroad uh, involved in this, uh, the Pennsylvania Railroad will now take over. Uh, this very rare photograph by DC Burnight taken on the morning of April 22nd uh, before the funeral train rolls out uh, um, shows the clearly the cars of the Pennsylvania Railroad. Those are the yellow uh, cars on the right. The funeral car of course is in the center. Uh, on the left is the uh, family and friends car. And this is the, uh, of course, the train station for the Pennsylvania Railroad and the Northern Central and the Cumberland Valley Railroad. Uh, look at this bridge. Uh, this is what the concern with the pilot train is you've got so many high bridges in Pennsylvania in particular uh, that there's a lot of concern in the Lincoln funeral train. You, you know, you drop that funeral train, you know, 50, 60 feet down into this abyss uh, over Conewago Creek. Uh, that could be a real disaster. So again, the pilot train goes over, make sure everything's fine. Uh, a signal man will alert the Lincoln funeral train that it's okay to proceed onto the bridge with no problems. Now, as the train approaches Lancaster, Pennsylvania, there's a, a carriage uh, sitting by itself uh, out in the countryside uh, and the occupant is former president James Buchanan. Uh, Buchanan never gets out of the carriage. It's about a mile from his Wheatland house uh, his estate to the train tracks for the Pennsylvania Railroad. Uh, and Buchanan will stay in there uh, staring at the funeral train as it goes by. Downtown Lancaster, Pennsylvania at the train station, again, much like Harrisburg, another 10,000 people. Only in this case, you've added another 10,000 people who come in from the countryside and you actually have twice as many people sitting in Lancaster for this 10 minute fuel stop Again, this uh, fuel stop that was typical for the PRR for every train that ran between, Lank, uh, between Harrisburg and Philadelphia. Couldn't make it all the way on just one load of fuel and one load of water. So Lancaster was the designated uh, stopping point here. Uh, this train, by the way, is getting tough to stop uh, because the women and children of Lancaster had strewn the train tracks with flowers. And those flowers uh, actually are going to reduce the friction and make it slippery as the train tries to stop in Lancaster and actually has to slide uh, into a position as opposed to actually break in position. After their 10 minute water stop, again, the red, rose, uh, red roses are brought on board from Lancaster people. Um, they're placed on Lincoln's coffin and it's now going uh, out of town. As it goes over the Conestoga Bridge, uh, there's a solitary figure standing underneath the bridge. 
it's United States Congressman Thaddeus Stevens, who had just, of course, worked so closely with the late president to make sure the 13th Amendment got passed. Stevens, of course, lives in uh, Lancaster. Uh, he is in Lancaster uh, on other business. He's not on board the train, of course. Uh, and he will stand there bareheaded, uh, according to a reporter uh, that is on the back of the train. It says that, that Stevens will be standing there without saying a word uh, as the train until he's long out of view. Now, the other stipulation that the government had put on the funeral train was that all traffic uh, on each railroad 30 minutes before the scheduled uh, travel of the funeral train uh, through 30 minutes after had to stop on a siding, designated sightings. So that's a one hour window in which each railroad is gonna lose revenue and those trains are not gonna be allowed to move. But Pennsylvania Railroad had selected Gap, uh, that's the middle of Amish country today in Eastern uh, Lancaster County. So here at the siding in Gap, there'll be a, a Pennsylvania Railroad train stacked up here, waiting to either go eastbound to uh, Philadelphia or westbound to Harrisburg. Uh, and the people will get out of the trains here at Gap. And as the funeral train rolls by again at 10 miles an hour, uh, most of the people on board these trains, uh, you know, not angry about the delays by any stretch of imagination. They are respectfully doffing their caps uh, and are saluting the train as it rolls through. Here's another bridge that they're very concerned about. This is the High Bridge of Coatesville, Pennsylvania. Rolls over that successfully at 220 with no problem. Reaches the Chester, Westchester, Pennsylvania uh, at about uh, 330. Train still pretty much on schedule, maybe about 10 minutes or so late. Uh, rolls into West Philadelphia. This photograph again is of the actual funeral train. That's Pennsylvania Railroad locomotive 331 under the control of John E. Miller, who is the engineer on the train. Uh, and there are still pennies in the in, in possession of the uh, Grand Army of the Republic, actually the Union Lake uh, Museum in downtown Philadelphia, still has pennies. Uh, my, many of us remember as children putting pennies on railroad tracks and, see, and, and collecting our squash souvenirs. Well, something as important as the Lincoln Funeral Train certainly brought that about. I know here in York, there are at least four cases of people who have uh, pennies or so that were uh, left on the tracks to be squashed. These two uh, are from the collection of the Union Lake. Uh, the funeral train arrives at the Philadelphia, Wilmington and Baltimore's railroad station at South Broad Street in Prime. Picture you see on the right in almost every book is misidentified as being taken in Baltimore. It's not, this picture was taken in Philadelphia at the Baltimore station of the Philadelphia, Wilmington and Baltimore Railroad. So this is Philadelphia. They called it the Baltimore station because that's where the train ran to, but the station is you know, on Broad Street in downtown or South Philadelphia. Uh, so again, it's way too often I see this picture misidentified in tons of Civil War books. So if you ever see it again, it's in Philadelphia, not in Baltimore. It is the Philadelphia, Wilmington and Baltimore station. Uh, this is the hearse uh, that uh, was provided by the city of Philadelphia. Uh, another view of the hearse. You can see the route the train is going to, uh, funeral hearse is going to take from the train station, uh, heading uh, Broad Street into downtown Philadelphia, where the body is going to be displayed at Independence Hall. Lincoln had made a speech on the admission of Kansas back in 1861 on his way to Washington for the inauguration. So Mrs. Lincoln and Robert Todd Lincoln wanted the body to be displayed at Independence Hall. Again, lots of photographs. The weather in Philadelphia is gorgeous uh, on April 22nd. So you get all these photographs. Here are just two of the many photographs that show the Lincoln hearse being hauled through the streets of uh, Philadelphia. Uh, Union Lake again has this wonderful art print that they sell. Uh, again, showing the, the red roses and the red flowers that are on board uh, as the funeral train, uh, funeral car uh, hearse, if you will, uh, proceeds through the streets. And you have a ticket. Uh, there's only a handful of tickets that still remain. Um, this is one example, again, from the Union League in Philadelphia, uh, showing the ticket that was required for admission to Independence Hall on the evening of April 22nd. Um, and you see the troops, these are uh, members of the 125th Pennsylvania 
infantry uh, lined up, also known as the 9th Union Lake Regiment, uh, lined up in front of near the Union Lake to actually greet the body of the late president. Uh, Lincoln's remains are put in Independence Hall, much like Harrisburg that evening. Uh, and so again, if you have these tickets, which were issued by Mayor Alexander Henry, a Republican, or the members of the city council, uh, and almost everybody comes are prominent Republicans uh, or patrons or donors to Major Mayor Henry's uh, re-election bid. And so uh, this is the body, uh, again, the catafalque on display on the left uh, in uh, Independence Hall. Now, on April 23rd, uh, the Lincoln uh, funeral is going to be have its high point, if you will. More than 300,000 people will pass by the coffin as a licensed state at Independence Hall. 10,000 people in Baltimore, 10,000 people in Harrisburg, 20,000 people had turned out in Lancaster, 300,000 show up in Philadelphia. Uh, the line stretches for three miles by 11 a.m. and people start getting impatient. They start crowding, people cut in line, people start hitting each other, brawls break out, melee start breaking out, two children have their arms broken, women have their clothes ripped uh, in the melee, gentlemen have their teeth knocked out, I and mean, it's a real mess. Uh, Governor Curtin will appear at one point uh, from the second story window of Independence Hall and scream uh, for the crowd to get under control. Uh, he's going to actually call out a thousand more cops and uh, bring in a thousand troops from, from Camp Cadwallader, uh, United States troops. And between these uh, 2,000 armed men, finally, 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 uh, order is restored. Uh, and by late afternoon, early evening, uh, it's fairly tame finally in Philadelphia a very raucous uh, afternoon. Again, 300,000 people. Now, by now, Lincoln's body is in pretty rough shape. So they're going to remove the body from Independence Hall that evening. They're going to take it to a, a uh, W, I think his name was W.D. Early, uh, was the, no relation of Jim Worley, spelled differently. Uh, but uh, Early was an undertaker. And they're actually taking Lincoln's body to a, a local undertaker. And the government undertaker and this private undertaker will work throughout the night to make Lincoln's body more presentable. Uh, it's now April 24th, uh, at four o'clock in the morning. Uh, the train is going to depart for New Jersey. Uh, they're going to cross the Delaware River at 530 and stop in New Jersey where Governor Joel Parker uh, a Democrat, an anti-Lincoln peace Democrat will step on board. Uh, he didn't get along with the president uh, necessarily. Uh, and so Parker become the first um, pretty much you know, anti-Lincoln governor uh, to get on board. Now, New Jersey will become the only state uh, where Lincoln's body will not be displayed at the state capitol. There's politics involved between Secretary of War Stanton and Governor Parker, uh, who doesn't, they don't like each other at all either. Uh, and so Stanton will not allow the body to be removed and taken uh, into Trenton. Uh, so uh, there was, you know, the, the train actually stops in Trenton, but it's more, again, a water stop. Body's not going to be removed. Uh, but New Jersey is going to hold their own ceremony minus the body. Uh, so they have the, uh, people lining the streets, they have a band playing, the morning bells are ringing, they have minute guns firing, and then they're gonna have a parade minus the coffin from the train station to the state capitol where different people are gonna make speeches, uh, lauding the uh, person. Now keep in mind, New Jersey voted against Lincoln in 1860 and 1864. New Jersey is of course also the home of George McClellan, who was the recently uh, had run against the president, of course, in 1864 for president as the Democratic Party's candidate. And he, of course, said Lincoln had had some memorable conversations after the Battle of Antietam. Uh, so New Jersey will not get to be the honor of having Lincoln's body lie in state in the state capitol. That's the only uh, state where it doesn't happen. Uh, now, the, the train's going to uh, roll through Newark, show up in Jersey City. The body's going to be taken off. Uh, you can see the Lincoln funeral train car itself is going to be put on a flatboat ferry and it's going to be taken across the Hudson River into downtown New York City. 
Uh, now this famous photograph on the left shows the procession uh, going past to Cornelius Van Schack Roosevelt, Roosevelt's mansion at 849 Broadway. Again, this is April 24th. Uh, I've blown it up in this picture. You see two children at the window. That is Elliot and Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, these are uh, the grandkids of Cornelius Roosevelt and president later when he's president, Teddy Roosevelt will talk about the fact as a child seeing uh, you know, this awesome spectacle of the president of the United States funeral cortege and procession marching right past the house in the open window that he and his brother Elliot are viewing it. Uh, the body's taken in New York City to City Hall. It's going to be on display for two days in New York City. Again, tens of thousands of people will come through uh, visiting in New York City. Massive crowds all day long on both the 24th and 25th. Uh, you can see how City Hall is all decked out, the nation mourns, et cetera. Uh, and again, uh, each town provides its own hearse, much like each railroad uh, provides its own railroad. Uh, we've had two railroads, by the way, in New Jersey. So I think if I'm up by my count, we're up to like seven uh, railroads so far that have had charge of the body. Uh, two more railroads will have charge of it as it leaves New York City, goes to Albany on April 26th, the funeral train. Uh, we'll arrive in Albany. Again, the body's going to be taken out. We'll be put on display in the New York State Capitol building. Uh, and this uh, time-lapse photograph, if you will, shows the funeral procession as it proceeds through the streets of Albany. On April 27th, the funeral train arrives in Buffalo. Uh, again, there are lots of photographs taken in Albany, Buffalo, New York, places like that. Again, the weather's really cooperating by now, it's fairly good for photography. Uh, so there are lots of pictures of both the crowds, the funeral car, uh, the funeral train, as well as the hearse as it goes through Buffalo. Now, by now, everybody on board's a little tired. Uh, and so they've kind of decided that we're gonna skip one of the planned stops, the planned stop in Erie, Pennsylvania. Uh, so the funeral train on the night of April 27th will go to the New York, Pennsylvania line and will stop for the night. Well, the mayor of Erie, Pennsylvania says, no, no, no. The train's supposed to come here in the middle of the night. And, you know, I don't know why you're canceling it. Uh, I don't care if everyone's tired, you're coming to Erie. He commandeers his own train, uh, rolls out uh, to uh, Northeast Pennsylvania uh, and gets on board the Lincoln funeral train and in effect says, Governor Curtin's not here. I'm taking possession of the train for the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. You're going to Erie. Uh, and of course, everybody on board is like, well, no, we're not going to Erie. We're stopping here for the night. And he's like, no, you're going to Erie. Uh, and this gutsy mayor uh, boldly commandeers now the Lincoln funeral train uh, and gets a rolling again uh, because they're in the middle of nowhere and it's late at night. They don't have telegraphic communications established with Washington to find out if this guy's really authorized to reverse course and take the funeral train to Buffalo. But he says he is. And so he gets it. And so the funeral train rolls into Erie, Pennsylvania at three o'clock in the morning. Town's bells ring. Some of the people wake up, uh, relatively sparse crowds, but they're actually allowed to go on board the train, not just the six women in York and not just the six women in Lancaster. Now you're allowing anybody and everybody in the town of Erie, Pennsylvania to get on the Lincoln funeral train. Uh, and so it's going to stop in Erie as long as people uh, need to see the body. And then the train will proceed westward towards Cleveland, Ohio. Again, <laughs> these high bridges. Here's another one uh, that the government's been very concerned about. Again, no issues whatsoever uh, with sabotage or anything along those lines uh, as the funeral train proceeds uh, along the Lake Erie. Uh, on the bottom left of the picture, uh, you'll see it leaves Springfield. Uh, Within about half an hour after Springfield, it'll roll through uh, northeastern Ohio, past again uh, where I used to live, where, where I could see the tracks of the Lincoln Funeral Train from my first apartment. And then I lived uh, less than uh, 500 yards from the train tracks most of the rest of the time uh, that I lived in northeast Ohio. So again, this subject has really fascinated me uh, for much of my adult life. On the 28th, uh, the funeral train's in Cleveland. On the 29th, it's in Columbus. Here's another mistake you often see in books. Uh, a lot of times you'll see pictures of the Nashville and they'll talk about this is the, the engineer, the engine that 
took the Lincoln Funeral Train from Washington to Springfield. No, it didn't. This is the train that took it from Cleveland to Columbus, uh, not from all the way. But again, so many books misidentify the Nashville as being the only locomotive for the entire trip. That's not true, of course. As we now know, uh, this is 17 different railroad locomotives that are involved in this endeavor. And the Nashville is only one small part of that as it rolls through the flat countryside uh, between Cleveland and Columbus. On April 30th, the funeral train arrives in Indianapolis as with Cleveland and Columbus, the bodies on display. Uh, goes to Michigan City, Indiana, where all the people are treated to a big breakfast, everybody on board uh, the train, uh, and then it rolls from there into Chicago, uh, where again, uh, Lincoln will have again, mass crowds, mass crowds in Chicago will greet the funeral train. So finally, on May 3rd, 1865, the Lincoln funeral train will roll into Springfield, Illinois. Um, Liz Wine and one of my friends here has an original CDV uh, showing the guards uh, at standing uh, before the open tomb before Lincoln and Willie's bodies are brought by hearse from the train station in Springfield to Lincoln's final resting place. This uh, journey will complete 480 hours of official United States mourning, uh, 200 hours of scheduled funerals in places like, again, uh, Harrisburg, Baltimore, Philadelphia, Albany, New York, et cetera, uh, in 12 different cities uh, along the way. The funeral train will go more than 1,600 miles. I think roughly, I think the exact count is 1,654 miles through 400 separate communities in seven states over a 13-day period. And the Lincoln's body is being treated almost the entire trip, particularly the second half of the trip, by that undertaker and embalmer just to make sure it's still in condition to be shown uh, in places like Indianapolis and Chicago on the latter part of the trip. So that gives you a flavor of the Lincoln funeral train and its passage through uh, the North uh, following the uh, assassination of Abraham Lincoln in Washington, DC and his final resting place in Springfield, Illinois. Uh, I want to thank everybody. If you want to go online, uh, the book's available on Amazon or from uh, book dealers uh, such as Jim Schmick and Civil War and More, et cetera, uh, for only $15. Uh, and portions of those proceeds will be given to uh, charity. I want to thank uh, the Congress of Civil War Roundtables. Thank you, Mike, uh, for your, uh, allowing me to present for the last few minutes. We'll now open it up on the floor. Mike will give instructions on how to uh, ask questions. Thanks so much.